Fasten your seat belts. It's going to be a bumpy night. Live from Las Vegas, it's time for you to be Talking Movies with America's most award-winning film critic, John Barber. You're being, John, you're being so gentle. I've heard you give reviews and you're so rough, you're saying. <laughs> How would you have evaluated your own work uh, in some of the films that you did prior to, uh, <laughs> prior to The Longest Shot? I mean, Much like... better than you, my friend. <laughs> Our next guest is one of those rare talents who has something to say and can say it funny. He's a writer-performer on the new Laugh-In and one of the most popular, outspoken, and entertaining personalities on the local news here in Los Angeles. He's won a half a dozen Emmys as a film critic and host of his own shows. Let's welcome Mr. John Barber, right over there. Hi, and welcome to Talking Movies. First of all, I'd like to... Thank Lynn Osanek of Black Op Radio for editing the fabulous, fabulous opening to our show. And then secondly, I want to thank fully Don and Doug Newsom, the owners and founders of BBS Radio Television. A few years ago, I did a wonderful show with them and now they're having me back to do this one, Talking Movies. But when I did this show a few years ago, they were in California and now, they're in Texas. Doug, how are you? And why are you in Texas? <laughs> Hi, John. Well, we moved to Texas because in paradise, we actually got burned up in the largest fire of California's history called the Paradise Campfire. And we lost everything, the business, our homes. And then everywhere we moved in California over the next couple of years, the fires just continued to follow us. It was always kind of harrowing in respect that we already lost everything. We didn't want to go through it again. It's a horrible experience. And we decided we're going to move somewhere where it's a little bit wetter and cheaper. And uh, did you find a place? And how do you like Texas? Texas has a lot of warm people. Of course, it's not as beautiful. It doesn't have the temperate uh, climate uh, near the coastline but it has lovely people. There's a lot of space. It's very flat, uh, but my brother and I like it because it's going to enable us to build our business for less. It, that's really important when you're dealing with business, trying to do things a little bit cheaper. Speaking, of, uh, speaking mm -hmm. of money, did uh, you and uh, Don and your attorneys manage to get a large bite out of PG&E that caused that fire? Interestingly enough, no. PG&E has problems. They settled for 50%, I believe, in stock. And I don't, it's the first time this has been done before where they pay out the payments in stock and their stock price has dropped in half. But because they wanted to pay it out in stock, there was a question mark of who pays the taxes. So they hired more lawyers. So their costs have quadrupled. So all the legal costs have quadrupled. The stock price has dropped in half. And two more big fires that are raging right now in California can be attributed to PG&E, which means they have very little money. They're settling for pennies on the dollar. And to be honest with you, my brother and I don't expect much. It's not a good situation. Well, I'm, I'm so glad you found the place. I'm delighted to be back here. And speaking of uh, paradise, for the last month here in the Las Vegas Valley, visibility has almost been ne negligible as well as breeding. We're just filled with California smoke. Right. You know, in the 50s, when I first ran away from Canada and got to Hollywood and realized I wasn't gonna become an, an actor, I decided to become a stand-up comic. And I remember the very, very first joke I ever wrote. The joke was, I'm having a very tough time finding the perfect California home, one that's fireproof and floats. <laughs> but, 
that is not very funny today. But in any event, before I ran away to California, when I was sort of an abandoned kid in Canada, uh, when I wasn't on a hockey rink or when I wasn't in jail or in a library, I was in a movie theater by myself from the ages of six to 16, devouring and living in these movies. As a matter of fact, it was Frank Capra and Jimmy Stewart who inspired me to move to the United States. Now, that was the first decade of my life, Doug, watching these movies. Now in the eighth decade of my life, I'm going to be talking about those movies. So maybe movies became the parenthesis of my life, which is lovely because I absolutely love them and I love movie makers. And so I'm thrilled to be back and, and doing the show. And you know, when I came to the United States in the 50s, television was new and it was alive with the most articulate, literate people I had ever seen and I had ever heard. I could name you 50 of them to begin with, David Susskind, his wife, Joyce Davidson, Gore Vidal, William Buckley, Jack Parr, Ed Murrow, Carl Sagan, The Cosmos, Dave Garraway, The Today Show, and of course, Alastair Cook with Masterpiece Theater and Omnibus. I could make, name dozens more, Doug, but they're all dead. Yeah. And so sadly is literacy, literacy and language in the media in this country. Oh, all yeah. except one place, and that place <laughs> is Turner Classic Movies on a Saturday night where a magnificent man, the author of this fabulous, fabulous, colorful, interesting book, hosts a show called Noir Alley. And I must tell you, I am so honored that he has agreed to be the first guest on our show. Now, you and I know that when we first designed the show, it was designed to have a, a guest for the first half hour of the show, then have open phones that we so we could talk to people about movies, which is, of course, my favorite subject. But unfortunately, our guest, Eddie Muller, is so articulate, so appealing, and so interesting, we're not going to be able to talk to anybody else, and they'll be very, very thankful for it. So right now, again... I am so honored. Here is the only person in the entire media that I make it a point to watch. So here's Eddie. There's nobody in the world I'd rather be talking movies with than you, but please <laughs> forgive the sort of technical goof up since this is our first show. Technology is to me is as tough as Biden getting out of Afghanistan, okay? So, <laughs> I um, can relate, yes. Okay. I And look at this. For the first time in 10 years, I have put on a suit, and it's the first time I've seen you without a suit jacket. Well, I, I am at home in my office, and I felt like, you know, going full <laughs> suit jacket and tie is a little much when you're just at home doing your work, you know? Yeah. So, but uh, I did, I did put on the tie and a vest for you, John. I got a vest. On. Where is home to you, Eddie? In the San Francisco Bay area. Oh, isn't that wonderful? My wife was born in San Francisco. My second professional job as a standup was at the hung hungry eye, but I, uh, yes, I have got to tell you something. Did you happen to see, the review I did on Facebook a week ago about your book. I have it? not seen that no. yet. Oh, you're kidding. I'm stunned. Anyway, I want you to go to your Facebook page when we're done. Okay. I'm and, not going to do it now. No, don't you do it now. And it's listed under once a critic, always a critic. You will see the most unbelievable book review of this fantastic book. And I'll tell you, the reason this book means so much to me is that all of the films and the directors and the film stars that you talk about, I saw when they first came out. Oh, <laughs> how about that? In your case. That's impressive. Yeah, well, in your case, you didn't see them until f film noir was 
sort of passe, and then you almost single-handedly with your fabulous books and with that unbelievably wonderful literate job you do as the host of uh, Noir Alley on TCM, you have given film noir and these movies a life that will last forever. And I must tell you, I love the book from the forward to the afterward. And we're <laughs> going to get to both of those and all that's in between. Now, as, and I must tell you, on Friday nights when you got together with Ben and you were doing the neo-noir, it was wonderful. Absolutely fabulous. So, and, and also on TCM, every time it comes on, I watch it. That is your moving tribute to your father, that he was a sports writer, and he sort of got you into this. I would like to know a little about your mother, the influence your mother might have had on you, where you were born, where you went to school, and do you have any siblings? <laughs> okay. Well, first, I have to start by saying thank you, John, for all the kind words. That That's really sweet, and that, that means a lot. Uh, you really know your stuff. And uh, it means quite a bit to me to have that, to have you say those things. So I appreciate it. Now, if, if, if we turned my camera a little bit, you'd see a beautiful portrait of my father on the wall behind me. But all I have to do is reach back here. This is funny. I had no idea you would ask about my mother, John, but this is my mother. Oh, my God. She's beautiful. That's my mom. She was yes, so. kind of short. Did anybody ever tell her that? Uh, she would have appreciated that. But, uh, what was her biggest influence on you? Um, gosh, that's uh, I mean, she was a good mom. I mean, I, I don't know what else to say. You know, she kind of kept me on the straight and narrow, I guess. But um, she was much more into movies than my father was really you know as you know my father was a sports writer and he he sort of thought that you know sports movies were so outlandish and unrealistic to him that he didn't really love movies the way my mother did my my mom was very much uh let's go to the movies she she had her favorite actresses so I would have to say that she participated more in my enthusiasm for movies than my dad did. But yeah. there but there is no question that I got my uh uh the fact that I write for a living is entirely due to my father who who showed me by example that it was a way you could you could make a living. Of all the artists in the world, the most revered to me are the writers. Writers well, and perhaps you musician. Did you have siblings, brothers or sisters? I did. I had two brothers and a sister, and I, I still have a brother and a sister. My oldest brother has passed away. Uh, but yes, and they're they're both in nearby. So uh yeah. Are you married? I am. I have been I actually, John, yesterday I celebrated my 36th wedding anniversary. Wow, that's fabulous. Do you have children? No, no children. I am the child. Oh my gosh! I, I, I have a, I have a, a, a plaque in my kitchen that says my grandchildren are cats. So my my son, who was executive producer and a writer for CSI and Criminal Minds for uh, about eight years, sadly does not have any children. Now you went to the movies with your mother. What was the first movie? that had an emotional impact on you and maybe the first movie that had an intellectual impact on you that might have stirred the memories of your father that turned you into the wonderful writer you are. Um, that's interesting. Um, I, I honestly haven't given this that much thought, but I do remember, um, here's a weird one because I never really went to the movies much during a school year. Uh, you know, that just wasn't something that I did. But during the summers, we vacationed in a small town in Northern California, uh, and it had a local movie theater. So I would always go to the movies at this theater. And I remember seeing uh, Frank Sinatra. In really? Von in Von Ryan's Express. Oh my God! When, when I was very young, 
And, you know, I don't remember that was young enough that I don't really remember the movies in total. But, you know, that had a very dramatic ending to the film. And I remember that. I remember seeing Lord Jim when I was very young. Um, I it's, it's just funny. I hadn't thought about this at all. Wait, so what, what was what was the first um, noir movie that stirs you? Because you have a line in the introduction that I absolutely loved. And that was that you would go to see any movie that had city <laughs> in it or night or something. I mean, it's a great line. So yeah, big, big city, night, street, yeah. any, of, any of those things in the title. <laughs> but but it, what's interesting, John, is you, you specifically asked me about going to the movies Right. which was different than watching the movies on TV. So it's interesting. Oh, now, now that I, I work for TCM and I realize how important it is to actually be able to provide these movies to people in their homes, that was really the way I first experienced all the noir films, was oh, on, on right. mo movies till dawn or dialing for dollars or something <laughs> like that. And, and the first one I really recall... Uh, tapping into me personally was a picture called Thieves Highway with Richard Conti and Valentina Cortesa. And, and that was because it was set in old San Francisco. And that was fascinating to me because that way it connected to my father because, oh, this is the San Francisco that my dad remembers because the city was very different by the time I was a teenager and and so I, it's always been interesting to me to sort of compare the different eras, you know. Uh, now this, this is at a time when you might not have been that interested in being a, a, a writer. So when you were a young teen, what were the things that you thought you might want to be? Play ball for the San Francisco Giants or play football? Or what was it you wanted to do? <laughs> No, no. Uh, I was never that much of an athlete that I thought I would ever make it uh, for the Giants. Although when you're the son of a sports writer, obviously you grow up quite quite a fan. And uh, and I still am to, to this day. Um, but I initially, I wanted to be an artist. I always wanted to be an artist of some sort. And I'm very uh, adept with uh, pen and brush. I, I actually... Uh, I thought at one point I would be a commercial artist. Really? Uh, yes. And, and I really loved my comic books. And so I thought maybe there's something to being a comic book artist. But you have to remember, John, this was before comic books took over the world. <laughs> <laughs> and, and back then, it was like, you don't want to pursue that because there, there can't be any money in that. And the only place you could get a job drawing comic books was in New York. And, and that was just a whole different era. So, does so the name, then. Uh, does the name Sergio Aragonis mean anything? Of to course. You? From Mad Magazine. Of course. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I spy. He was one of my closest friends for 10 years in Los Angeles. And he designed every set that I ever did when I was a talk show host. That's, that is fantastic. Well, you and know, it, you're going to find as we go along, there are things that we had in common that strike me as serendipity. You're not going to believe some of this stuff. Now, you wanted to be an artist. What kind of jobs did you hold before you decided, you know what, I want to be a writer? House painter and bartender. Those are the only <laughs> two other jobs I've had. I, I was good at one of them. <laughs> the painting? Or the bartending? <laughs> no, I was actually better as a bartender than I was as a house painter. Okay, so now we come to, because there's nothing really tougher than looking at a blank page. And then here you are wrapped up in the business of noir. How old were you when you decided, you know what, I would like to write about this? Uh, well, do you mean, do you mean write about film noir or just write for a living? Well, both. I guess write for a living, but then especially about film noir, because where it has accidentally led you, according to this outstanding afterword in the book, is just phenomenal. Yeah, so, it, 
when 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 did you decide and how old were you when you decided I want to write about film noir those movies um I would I was it came pretty late I would say I was 40 maybe 40 years old but but here's the thing about wanting to be a writer and this is very interesting that you ask this is um when I was a teenager, I'm going to say it was 1969 or something like that. So I was still very, very young. But my dad came home one day from the office with a book called Fat City. Oh, uh, wow. Right? By, by an, a young writer, I think he was 29 at the time, named Leonard Gardner. And my dad gave my dad would always come home from the office and give me stuff, photographs or books or record albums that there was a great music critic at the examiner named Philip Elwood. And Phil Elwood would always give my dad records to give to me. So that's how I got my music education. But uh, I read my dad said, I'm not going to read this book. You read it. <laughs> and it was a great book about uh, tank town boxers. Right. And I read this book and I recognized these characters in the book as all the people that my father knew wow. that I, and that I knew. It's like, wow, this is amazing how this guy captured all of this. And I was really uh, thrilled by this book. And, and that was the book that convinced me I wanted to be a writer. And so uh, it was very exciting when years later I wrote my first novel and it, it was very much inspired by Fat City and by the life of my father. And, and what happened to that no novel? And what was it called? It's called The Distance. And it was published in, uh, I think, 2001 or 2002. It was very well reviewed. And, and through that, I met Leonard Gardner. And, and we are still very close friends to this day. And I have no hesitation in saying that Leonard, uh, Leonard's writing inspired me to, to be a novelist specifically. And then everything else kind of came later. And, and then I, I learned how to just write on deadline and write for a paycheck. And, <laughs> and that was it. Once I figured that out, there was no more house painting and no more bartending. Well, when it came to film noir, you were obviously picking a subject that was on only one television channel, uh, very sparingly, and not may maybe a very large audience for those films. And you were going to write about them. Were you cautious at first that maybe you wouldn't find an audience, an audience as big as maybe the one you had for your novel? Oh, the audience for the film noir book was bigger than the audience I had for the novel. That's yeah, for but sure. you didn't expect it. Correct. Uh, I love the movies. I, I realize in hindsight, I do a lot of things on instinct, John. It's just like I, I would enjoy writing about this. It was Dark City, the original version, was my second book. My first book, this, I don't know if you're aware of this, was about the history of adults-only movies. Oh, that was the first book I ever wrote, was about the history of adults-only movies, which is not as titillating as it sounds. It was more of a sociology book about what constituted adults-only in 1930 as opposed to 1940 or 50 or, or wow. later. Um, and, and it was very interesting, but the movies aren't very good. So St. Martin's, who the publishing house that did that said, well, the book turned out great. We'd like to do another. And I said, well, how about if I write about film noir? Because I actually like those movies. And as I mentioned, I, I sort of grew up with them. I was very, they made quite an impression on me when I was young, but I didn't think there was any way to, to write about the films or to like, what, what's happened to me now is incredible because I don't think anything like this existed. Uh, honestly, it didn't. I think Robert Osborne on TCM sort of created this whole thing, right? Like, or, or you, well, John, what am I saying? You've been doing this for years, you know, just talking about movies and having a, a livelihood based on that. I didn't know that such a thing existed. 
<laughs> and then I wrote this book and I was asked to, to program a film festival based on the book. And then things just kept snowballing to where I, I, you know. The wonderful thing about the afterward, and I want you to continue with that, is that all of this happened to you by accident. Yes. After your book came out. So go on with the, the, the business of setting up the film festivals, which I'm sure is what obviously led you to TCM. Uh, yes, in, in many ways that is true. So uh, I set up the film festivals and then the, the, they were successful. And, and I always joke, John, because I say, you know, if somebody like me existed when I was going to movies in, in my younger life, we who got up in front of the audience and started talking about the movie in context, we probably would have called the police, right? Like, who is this guy getting up and talking about the movie? You know, we're just here to watch the movie. Uh, but but now we need the context so that people appreciate the films because they've changed, films have changed so much. But um, I started doing a whole series of film festivals around the country and they were so profitable that I felt, honestly, I felt uh, unworthy of making this money because like, why am I getting a profit out of this? The especially when there are films I want to show that have disappeared. So that's when I created this nonprofit foundation, the Film Noir Foundation, specifically to use the money uh, from these festivals to find and restore missing films. And, and that, that sort of is what all of this led to being on TCM's radar and quite honestly, one of the festivals I did in Hollywood for many years at the Egyptian Theater, I got my first interaction with TCM was when they called me and said, we want your dates. You have, <laughs> you have dates at that theater that we want for our film festival. And, I, and just like a good gang boss, I said, well, what do you got to trade? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. And wonderful. <laughs> well, the thing is, they also, not only did you give you that platform, you know, if gold is stuck in the mountains for 5,000 years and you extract it, it's still valuable as gold. And that's what you have done with these, these films. Not only did they give you the platform, they let you say what you wanted to say about these films which to someone like you and any writer is absolutely and totally precious. I mean, I tell everybody that, you know, when I first came to the country in the, in the fifth, first of all, I was the very first person to ever review movies on television. And because of the fairness doctrine, I'm the only critic who's ever had the Supreme Court rule on uh, a film, which happened to be a Supreme Court decision on Sullivan Green. <laughs> which I won't get into. And then in 1975, um, uh, the reason I'm bringing this up is quite accidentally a lady is writing. Uh, she found out I was a critic for LA Magazine for 10 years and five years at KNBC. And uh, why I wanted to become a critic. And I said, I didn't, it was an accident. I mean, I used to do it in my act. I was imitating people like Jonathan Winters and Lenny Bruce, who did satire on movies. Mm -hmm. Somebody saw me and hired me to do AM Los Angeles, where I accidentally started to do reviews in 1975. Um, by accident one night, I went to the Westwood Theater to see a film called Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore. And I absolutely loved the film, the right people there. It was on a Thursday night. So Friday night was my night with Tom Snyder to review films. So I gave it an absolute rave review, said it was the best movie about a, a woman I'd ever seen. I was going to take my wife the next flight to prove it. Got there Saturday night. It was standing room only to get in. I got a call two days later from Marty Scorsese. And he asked me to call Warner Brothers because there was a brief opening there, which was an homage to Wizard of Oz. And they wanted yeah. to take it out. So he said, would you call the brass and tell them to leave it in? I said, this is a conflict of interest to me 
Mr. Scorsese, but I will do it. I called him. A month later, in an interview he did with Calendar Magazine, he credited the film critic for saving Alice Doesn't Live Here from Obscurity. So I've only done it with one movie. You've done it with <laughs> dozens and dozens. Now, to some of the stories in the in the book, you have 50 more books of stories just in there <laughs> and 50 more movies. So I want to get to, oh, some of the people, oh my gosh, I, I saw them all. And you, no, no, noir is dark, but there's, a, and that's why I'm wearing this suit in your honor, but you never see them in your book as dark. And yet somehow you were attracted to bad guys. And Shakespeare knew it hundreds of years ago that the villains are a lot more interesting. Iago's more interesting than Othello, and Shakespeare wrote a whole play about Richard III. And you dwell on some of these people, and their stories are fabulous. And one of the dark characters, but fascinating, was John Garfield. Tell me a little bit about John Garfield and how you became interested in his story. Uh, I just, I always liked him as a performer. I always felt that, um, you know, again, because of the background in sports writing, I tend to sometimes think of performers like they're athletes or something. And because Garfield had done uh, Body and Soul, obviously one of the great boxing movies, and because he was so identifiably Jewish, to Jewish viewers the way Jimmy Cagney was so Irish yes. to Irish viewers, I found that sort of fascinating, like how these performers become symbols, you know, uh, for, for their particular groups, right? Uh, and then when I learned the story of how he died so young at only 39 years of age, uh, I thought this was an amazing saga and a, and a great tragedy in a way. And then, then, of course, I met his daughter and became very good friends with Julie Garfield, his daughter. And she, you know, filled me in on a lot of his personal background. And it was it was all just fascinating to me. And and thank you for pointing out, John, that, you know, in the book, yeah, there's a lot of darkness. But I'm I'm always fascinated by by the dark side of things, but yet how people persevere. Uh, and, and a lot of these Hollywood stories, the people had really, you know, debilitating problems. Either they were self-destructive or, you know, uh, a lot of alcoholism, but yet they produced great work. They produced incredible work, which I find very, very inspiring. You know, not every not everybody gets the happily ever after story, which I appreciate when those happen. Uh, but I, I I admire people who persevere through through bad circumstance. Well, one of the things that I really, really admired, because I had encountered it when I first came here in the 50s, uh, deported twice from the United States. As a matter of fact, it was movies that made me kept coming here. Frank Capra and Jimmy Stewart, and they kept throwing me out in 1977. <laughs> it was Senator John Tunney who gave me my citizenship papers, but I had encountered something that I couldn't believe coming from Canada, and it was something called the blacklist. And I was so thrilled to see and then when you see my review of your book, I can't wait. Not only do I mention that the one thing I forgot to say is I, I not only should it be in film classes, it should be in social study classes, American history classes, but political classes. I forgot to say it should also be in writing classes because every page is just wonderfully written. But the the thing is the blacklist is brought up frequently and how it infected many, many of the talents of the business. I want to know how it affected John Garfield because I loved Garfield. The postman always brings twice. Well, there are a lot of people, including his daughter, Julie, who will say that it was, you know, the blacklist and, and the pressure brought upon Garfield by 
you know, the, the feds, the G-men and uh, working for the House Committee on Un-American Activities that sort of drove him to death. I mean, Abraham Polanski thought that, Julie Garfield thought that. I, I mean, obviously he had a heart condition and none of the stress that he was put, placed under helped that at all. And, uh, you know, he died tragically, you know, he, as, as Polanski said, and I quote him in the book, you know, he defended his street boy's honor by ratting out no one and they killed him for it. I, I have to point out Polanski, you mentioned the name, but he was a writer. Another wonderful thing about the book is all the fabulous writers you point out, like Polanski. So continue with your story about Polanski and why you quote him. Well, because he was, he was important to the creation of this book because I actually was able to interview him at some length uh, before he passed away when I did the, the book originally. And he really had an attitude about working in Hollywood and making films that colored my approach to the book. Because uh, that period, that late 40s, early 50s period, because of the political turmoil of the time, uh, you know, the pressure was turned up on artists in Hollywood to a degree that they had never faced before or honestly since. And so it was creating art and entertainment in a pressure cooker. And, and I really got an insight into that from Abe Polanski. And, and what he had said at the end was, you know, Garfield... Uh, you know, they pressured him to name names because he was a big star. And if you could turn a big star and, and make them an informant, they figured, you know, that all the better. It's just, just like in crime, you know, the higher up the food chain, the more they want to turn them. Uh, but he, re he refused to do it and he wouldn't collaborate with them. And, uh, and then he had his heart attack and died. And, you know, Polanski deeply believed that, you know, he he was killed for defending his honor. You know that that happened to many of them. But you mentioned uh, an actress, an absolutely phenomenal actress, who bucked uh, the House uh, American Activities Committee. I think she even crossed picket lines. I think her r birth name was Ruby Stevens. Am I correct in that? Well, that would be Barbara Stanwyck that That's you're talking right. about. Yeah. Tell us about Barbara. Who well, you know, it, it's interesting you say that, John, because Barbara Stanwyck would eventually become, I, I think, one of the most high-profile conservatives in Hollywood. I mean, she, but, but she was almost more apolitical than she was a conservative. She, she was adamant about protecting her work and career. That was, she was the workaholic. And, and I have no bones about saying that, in my estimation, Barbara Stanwyck is the greatest actress of all time, you know, at least in Hollywood. Uh, just second to none. Uh, you know, but she was, uh, she was certainly not on the side of the fellow travelers <laughs> during, during that period. That, okay, and I want to uh, also ask you about uh, her marriage to Frances Faye, but when you talk about the greatest actress, I think she'd have to share that pedestal with Betty Davis. Uh, Betty Davis, just uh, just uh, outstanding uh, to me. Just She may be up there all along. Now, all, all of these things, John, are subjective. That's I've, learned, I've learned that long ago, right? Yeah. I mean... That, well, that we're, we're all critics, even if you're not getting paid for it. We're, we all know what we like and what we don't like. I, when, I, when I was on the air, I used to get a lot of uh, uh, mails from people, uh, mail from people. Well, what makes you a, a, a critic? Uh, uh, what, uh, did you use your mind or you do you use your heart to look at a movie? And I said, no, I use my ass. Because if my ass doesn't move, I use my mind to try to get what's my ass trying to tell me. And I have never moved it when I watch the Betty Davis movie. Now, Stanwyck married uh, uh, Frank Fay, a comedian, right? Right, right. And it was, I got the impression that 
that relationship might have been the foundation for the frequently made movies called A Star, a, is, Born. A Star is Born. Yes. Oh, there, I, a, yeah. Well, that. that's the that's the impression that I got. I mean, I, I heard that enough times in various places that I, I cite that in the book. Uh, obviously, I'm not old enough to have been there or know that for a fact. But yes, it was uh, when they met, Frank Fay was the big star, uh, really, in New York. And then when they went to Hollywood, I mean, Stanwick just hit Hollywood like, you know, just gangbusters. I mean, yeah. it, William Wellman wanted her and Capra wanted her. And she's in all these spectacular pre-code movies. And, and I mean, it didn't take any time at all for her to establish herself as like the the hottest actress in Hollywood. And it sort of left Frank Fay in the dust, right? And so he just became this miserable alcoholic. And, and you know, that's that's the Star is Born saga. Did he really try to strangle her? Uh, or she uh, him? <laughs> no, I don't think she would have tried to strangle him. Sadly, I there are instances in Stanwyck's... Uh, life where she seems to be she doesn't take rejection too well and and she seems to have a little self-destructive bent you know when when she would discover that robert taylor was not faithful to her she had a tendency to do more harm to herself than to robert taylor in retaliation so uh that that was unfortunate but you know by the end, I, I don't think there's a single performer in Hollywood that had the respect of her colleagues the way Stanwyck did. Not only that, she was one of the very few females who survived movies to succeed in television with Big Valley. Now, you mentioned uh, another actress who was sort of well made, uh, uh, self made, started from nothing. And then you talked about how self-destructive some of them can be. There are two actresses who are stories I want you to tell. One is one that I've really liked a lot in all of these noir movies, and she sort of somehow didn't seem to survive them, and that was Gloria Graham. I, I knew I knew that name was coming. Yes, and I think they're doing a where on TCM we're doing a, an all day Gloria Graham, uh, you know, summer under the stars day for Gloria, and I'll be doing some special things with Gloria on upcoming episodes of of Noir Alley. Um, I think that Gloria Graham's story is interesting because it it shows how difficult it can be for women in Hollywood because she was so expert at doing a unique character that I don't think you saw many women play, which was she was the femme fatale, but she was also funny. She had a great humorous streak in her. She was extremely bright, but she started getting typecast. And I think the typecasting of her as the bad girl in these movies became hurtful to her and and it was very difficult for her to maintain a career. So it's kind of fascinating how popular she is today. I can say after 20 years of doing festivals and things that I, I think Gloria Graham is now the most popular actress in film noir. You know she 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 would have liked to have known that when she was alive because I, it didn't really happen during her lifetime. You know what you are, Eddie, aside from everything else? You know what you are? <laughs> You're a gentleman. Because you say things in the book about Gloria, and it reminded me of a quote in Shakespeare that is in Ecclesiastes. It's in the Bible. Vanity is all. And it looks like it destroyed Gloria Graham, and it looks like it also destroyed... Joan Crawford. Now, if you don't want to, because I'm so tempted, I, I don't want to gossip, but I mean, I, I remember when this happened, when she went out with her husband's 13-year-old brother or son or something. Tell us that story, then tell us. Sadly, I know you don't want to do it because you are a gentleman, how <laughs> tough it was for her 
when she thought she was losing her beauty at the end. Oh yeah, well, she had she had. I don't I don't know if saying earned a reputation. She ended up being saddled with a reputation as a little bit of a kook because uh, she did have a an affair uh, with Nick Ray's thirteen year old son, and and. I mean, it wasn't like a one-time thing. I mean, Tony Ray ended up marrying Gloria Graham. I think uh, he was her fourth husband, and uh, and he's a pretty interesting character himself. You know, he was the one of the stars of John Cassavetti's Shadows, yes. uh, and you know, was a very talented guy. Uh, but the thing that's odd about Gloria is she would do all kinds of because of her vanity, she would do all kinds of cosmetic surgeries to her mouth and things. But but when it came down to it at the end, when she was diagnosed uh, with cancer, she treated it holistically and, and didn't get, I don't feel that she got the best care and, uh, and died really young and uh, unnecessarily perhaps. Um, but you're right. She did. Um, she did alter her looks because she just panicked. I think in the fifties, she panicked and thought, you know, I have to be that alluring, sexy dame if I'm going to keep working. Of course, she she went on and made movies later. You know, God bless the folks who put her in chilly scenes of winter. She's she's terrific in that. Um, but you know, this is something that befalls women in Hollywood that is really unfair is, you know, it's their expiration date. They have a much earlier expiration date as movie stars than the men do. You know, you see Robert Redford gets to play Robert Redford into his eighties. Clint yeah. Eastwood plays Clint Eastwood into his eighties. You know, you're, you're not going to see women getting that opportunity. Well, one that came close to that who had the same kind of, I'm going to be a star syndrome and made herself into a star is another fabulous story in the book. And that is Joan Crawford. I mean, she is a knockout in Mildred Pierce. Now, after you t tell us about uh, Joan and what happened to her in later life, because of your later, uh, because of your love for writers, because of your fathers, I have three or four I want to mention. And I think one of them is the author of one of your favorite Stan Wick movies, Double Indemnity. So tell us about Joan. You can see I've almost memorized your book. <laughs> yes, I'm impressed, John. I am very impressed. Listen, it's so beautifully made. I almost caress the pages when I read it. They're like dull, but it's just that's, I over them all the time. Anyway. I like that. I like that. That's that's. See, you want a book. You you want to hold the book, and it has to be substantial. It's a, it's not the same looking at it on a computer screen or something. You have to actually hold it in your hands. Okay, so tell us about Joan. Well, Joan, my my take on Joan is that I I confess that I have sort of attempted uh, to rehabilitate Joan's reputation, you know, after Mommy Dearest and and all of that, and that she's a figure of of camp and a lot of ridicule. Um, I, I just feel, but she's also made this incredible string of movies in her prime or some people would say tried to tell her she was past her prime right in in which she was not only the star but she was essentially the producer of these films she you know when jerry wald chose her to to do mildred pierce and basically salvaged her career after mgm had dumped her uh you know she was paying attention you know and a lot of times people think of these diva-ish movie stars as just runaway freight trains of selfishness or something. But Joan was smart. Joan listened and she understood how Jerry Wald made that movie. And then she just did it herself. She could repeat the recipe, you know, whether it was with Jerry Wald or on her own. And, you know, she had multiple second and third acts in her career. It got a little shaky towards the end because you know, like you mentioned, the, the vanity, she was trying to 
make herself up to look young again. And that's where the campiness came in. But, you know, and then it's shocking to me how many of these performers like would marry wealthy men and then discover that the men were broke. <laughs> oh my God. That happened to Debbie Reynolds with every husband. <laughs> yeah. It, it's, it's mind boggling that these women get involved with these guys. And, and that's what happened when Joan married Alfred Steele, who was like a big, you know, worked for Pepsi Cola. And she thought, well, this is great. You know, we're set. If the movies don't, support me at least i've got pepsi cola but then that all the bottom fell out of that and uh yeah joan joan had a rough rough end but i just think her legacy is is phenomenal really it, it uh, is and, and you know a lot of people sort of they think that whatever happened to baby jane is camp but i just think it's astounding that betty davis and joan crawford made that movie at their age. I think it's just phenomenal. I, I totally agree. I totally agree. I mean, I, I get what it is that people find campy and crazy about that, but they, they were professional actresses. The fact that they did that, um, it, it's just another phase of an incredible career. I, I kind of, it kind of irks me when sometimes people just look at that and say, well, that's Betty Davis and Joan Crawford. And it's like, oh my God, no way. I mean, that's another chapter in their stories, but it's certainly not how they should be identified. Now to some of the wonderful writers that you mentioned, and this surprised me, that the author of Double Indemnity and the Postman Always Rings Trice never thought of himself as a writer. Tell us that story. Well, <laughs> he thought of James M. Cain thought of himself as a newspaper man, which I totally understand because my father was a newspaper man. And it's interesting how many examples there are in my book of writers who went to Hollywood because they were convinced they could make a quick buck and be paid better than they were in the newspaper business. But they thought of Hollywood as a step down from, from working for newspapers because let, let's face it, John, uh, you know, in the 20th century, in 20th century America, the newspaper business was everything. It was king. It Yes, it and was. Um, to to work for the newspaper, you you were part of the nerve center that made the modern American city run, you know, and and it, it was incredible. And so to work for Hollywood was was nothing. To guys like Ben Hecht and Herman Mankiewicz and Gene Fowler, who'd worked in the newspaper business, or even somebody like Richard Brooks. Uh, it, it was the movies were a step down. Well, there you go again, serendipity. You met I. I interviewed uh, you a few years ago, and I happen to mention offhand that my very favorite, second favorite writer in the world, next to Mark Twain, was Ben Hecht. So I'm going to have you. I just want want to tell quickly how this happened. I was 17 years of age, still illegally in the country. Um, um, a male boy at Paramount Studios and accidentally picked up a child of the century. And it's the only fan letter I ever wrote in my life. Mm. I sat down as a 17-year-old, wrote to his publisher, I never thought he'd get it, and said, I was sorry I ever picked this book up by accident and started reading it. And then I continued, I said, because if uh, another new book doesn't come out uh, by Mark Twain. You have spoiled my reading for the rest of my life. Ten days later, I got a two or three page handwritten letter from Ben Hecht. He was on his way to Laguna Beach to the Laguna Playhouse to put on his one act play, Winkleberg, and invited me to come down and be his assistant. So I was thrilled when you talked about now Richard Brooks. Uh, when I was doing stand-up for uh, Merv Griffin all the time. As a matter of fact, when Merv went to CBS, he recommended me to Westinghouse to be his replacement. And so uh, instead of David Frost, when I filled in for Merv, my 
ratings were better than Merv's because I did stand up. Merv just sang a, a song. That's all that he did. But he was very good at what he did as a host. So in any event, at that time, they were going to make In Cold Blood. And, and, and Mort Lindsay was a band leader, said, geez, you look like one of those guys that committed that murder. <laughs> so I got myself an 8 by 10 glossy, and I put some scars on me, and I mailed it to Richard Brooks looking to audition because I had spent a year That's in a funny. repertory company in England as an actor, and I never heard from him. So I end up accidentally becoming a critic. And Tom Snyder tells this story on the air that he found out that I was an actor and he found this picture of me being a gangster. And I got a call from Richard Brooks. And he said, why didn't you phone me? And I said, listen, you're not going to take some call from some un unknown Canadian. He said, could you come down here? I have something I'd love to show you. And I said, uh, "Why?" I said, I'm a critic. I said, I hope it's not a movie because it's a conflict. He said, it is, it is a movie, and you don't have to review it, okay? Because I just want to meet you. So I go down there, and he tells me about his days as a newspaper man, yeah. as Ben Hecht did, and I loved it. So he said, okay, I've set up a private screening. Go in and watch the movie. It was looking for Mr. Oh, Dubar. yeah, yeah. And I said, I forget the name of the actress in it. I said, Diane she, Keaton. Diane Keaton. We'll never have a film that that good. So we were friends for the next 10 years. Richard That's fantastic. Yeah, and, and these stories happen all the time. Anyway, about Ben Hecht. Tell about when he first went to RKO and tell that great Scarface story because <laughs> Ben invented the gangster movies. The, yeah, that's right. Geez, John, you're getting me to give away all my best stories. You know, we want to leave we, something we, for the people hold, to hold it. We barely touched the sur surface, and I know what's going to happen. I mean, I wanted to talk to you for a half an hour, and an hour has just flown by. Okay, so oh, in, a, in a month or two, I'm going to call Taryn, and I said, you know, I want to talk to that guy again because I could just, I love movies. I absolutely love movies. And you know what? I think I have your home address somewhere, but what I I think that I sent you a copy of my autobiography. Yes, uh, yes, you did. You did. And I'm sure you didn't read it because it's 752 pages and you're not going to pick it up. You're going to leave it there as a door, door jam. If you get in there, I'm going to tell you something. I'm not lying. It is by far the best book ever written about anyone in show business. And I have read them all. I've read them all, and I've only written one. And the guy who did the for Harlan Ellison was going to do the forward to it until he died. And it was done by a fellow named Donald Jeffries, who has five books published, really successful. He said the best book ever written in the English language is David Copperfield. And he said, John Barber's book is David Copperfield Goes to Hollywood. So I'm glad you nice. have it because nice. if you go in there, it is, I stole Ben Heck's style from the child of the century. There are no chapters. It's all headings as though they're called. Yeah. Yeah. So if you go in there and you find Haskell Wetzkler, you'll find out how I learned about blacklisting and almost not, you know, the thing I love about you and your work and everything all these great things happen to you by accident. I met Jim Garrison by accident. I got real people on by accident. Got my first AM show by accident. Every day, and I'm doing this new series by accident. Just well, you know, but you know, John, you know very well, John. If you're if that's going to work, you have to be prepared for the accidents. <laughs> Yeah, right. Uh, well, uh, yeah, but you know, yeah, I guess you pr were prepared when everything happened to you, but I, you know, yeah, because you had a history once, once you uh, published the noir book and you went out with these film festivals, you had to talk to an audience. So it's no hard step for you when TCM says, Hey, come on, Bob Osborne says, Come on over here and do this. You're so perfectly prepared. And I well, it's inter it's interesting, John. That's that's something um, that isn't talked about much in my resume. Uh, that I also inherited from my dad. It's not just the ability to to write, but my dad was a really comfortable public speaker, 
and uh -huh. and and they would always get him whenever there was like a group of, you know, an, an annual dinner of a bunch of old boxers or something. <laughs> He was the guy that they always said, Ed, get up and tell your stories. Tell them the stories. Oh, and that was that. I have definitely inherited that from my dad. I've also inherited, when I was a kid, I remember my dad, the phone ringing late at night. And my dad would get out of bed and like, yeah, what do you want? And, and it'd be two guys in a bar looking to settle a bet and they would call my dad to settle this bet right before they went home it's like i believe that you know fred apostoli fought harry kid matthews in seattle in 1940 and my dad would just go yeah yeah you're right but he knocked him out in the fifth round not the seventh round you know and then he'd hang up and and now i get that but i get it by email people email me and say I saw a movie once. There was a road. It was raining. There was a car. You know, <laughs> what okay. was the movie? We're gonna have to. We're gonna oh half. Oh my God. Uh, oh, this is. I hate to say goodbye to you, but you must tell very quickly. When Ben Heck first went to RKO to work for Howard Hughes, and you can tell that in a few uh, in a few, a few uh, sentences, and then. The, when he started the movie Scarface at Paramount. That's one of my favorite stories in the book. I, I hope I remember these right. Uh, <laughs> but obviously, uh, Ben Hecht had written uh, the script for the movie Underworld, uh, which was made by, um, by Joseph von Sternberg. And that's what got him the job, which he, he thought nothing of von Sternberg. You know, as a director, he thought he was really crazy and over the top. But then when he got the uh, the job to write Scarface, uh, then he got a midnight visit from some, uh, some of the guys from Chicago, decided to pay him a visit because they'd heard that the movie was about Capone. And Ben, ben Heck very adroitly convinced them otherwise because you know oh no it's not about him at all we just wanted the name scarface because then people would want to see it but it's not about al at all look that's that's what we call show business <laughs> <laughs> he talked these guys out of it amazingly yeah and, and and even managed to throw in some insults to howard hughes who was putting up the money because they said, who is this guy, Howard Hughes? And, and Heck said, oh, he's just the sucker with the money. And He doesn't, and, he doesn't mean anything. <laughs> okay, then tell us finally uh, how he demanded he be paid by Howard Hughes. Oh, that's right. He had to be paid in cash because it was like in, in the how off much? chance. How uh, much? I, I, I'm, I'm trying to remember. Tell it, me, John. It was $1,000 every day. A thousand dollars a day in cash. That's right. In in the in case Mr. Hughes proved to be insolvent. <laughs> he didn't want he didn't want it delivered to him personally because he locked his writer's door. He insisted it be pushed in Put, under the door. Pushed in under the door. Oh, and you know, he, later on, I think Howard Hughes adopted some of these techniques himself because <laughs> he he would have these these very particular things of you know you got to meet me in this place at this time and oh you know what I got a million stories to hear from you and a million to tell you about Robert Ryan and Alfred Hitchcock and a bunch of others. So I'm going to be calling Taryn in about four months. Fantastic. Or and I hope by that time you get a chance to peek at the book because you're going to be knocked out. And tell me, I wouldn't lie to you, okay? I will. In fact, in fact, John, I'm going to I'm going to put your book on my bookshelf right next to Child of the Century. Oh, so, my. so you and Ben Hecht will be side by side on my bookshelf. That's well, only the, right. The, the the last time I went into Edmund Bookstore, and by the way, when when this goes on the air, you're going to see that picture of you sitting behind a stack of <laughs> Dark City, one of my favorites. Last time I went at Larry Edmonds' book, bookstore, uh, I had just done uh, a CSI. I co-starred with Tim Conway because the writer named Rambo had seen me. Uh, my son got married at the Henry Fonda Theater, and he asked me to do a stand-up for him. At the, so I did. Anyway, the guy thought it was funny. 
So I wrote this uh, ripoff of the Sunshine Boys, and I'm hired uh, to be a partner to Tim Conway, and he murders me. Anyway, uh, it, it did it did really well, and I wanted to thank him. So I went into Larry Edmonds Bookstore, and I bought an original uh, first edition of Ben Hicks and Child of the Century, and it cost $70. Mm. And every And you know, that's a, I walked in there accidentally in 1970 when I was doing the AM show, and that's where I accidentally picked up Jim Garrison's book, A Heritage of Stone, and then booked him on my show the next day and was fired. But in any event, oh. I, in any event, thank you, thank you so much. And it's true, honest to God, you are by far the most articulate voice on any of television and by far the best dressed. <laughs> I I appreciate that very much, John. And I will tell you, I I am happy to come back on the show anytime. I enjoy speaking with you so much. I learned so much from you uh, that it, it's an absolute delight. Oh, well, thank you again. I, I'm just, I'm delighted. And it's, uh, by the way, I had to, Google a tutorial on how to tie a Windsor knot. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Stay safe and stay well. And if I were religious, I'd say God bless you. Well, I'll take it anyway. But I uh, appreciate it very much, John. You stay well, and we'll do this again very soon. Okay, thanks. Bye-bye. All right, take care. Once again, thanks and kudos to Turner Classic Movies for giving us Eddie Muller. And again, more kudos to Turner Classic Movies for this month letting the country finally know about that icon, Paul Robeson, the greatest artist activist ever developed or destroyed by America. See you in two weeks with another fabulous guest to be talking movies. Till then, good luck.